in there. Now, if you are Venezuela, Saudi Arabia or BP, the year has not started well. Something extraordinary has been happening to the oil price. It's been tumbling to levels no one thought we'd see. Brent crude dropped below $30 a barrel for the first time in nearly 12 years today. BP has in fact announced job cuts in its, its North Sea activities. The Chancellor, you might remember, referred to a cocktail of risks in the world economy last week. Some think cheap oil is one ingredient of that cocktail, a harbinger of doom. Others think it's going to ameliorate the worst. So which is it? It's interesting that for all its importance in our lives, you don't very often get to see large amounts of oil, to stand in awe at its purity and its power, to actually smell the stuff. This installation at the Saatchi Gallery is probably one of the best places to do that. When it comes to assessing the effect of a change in the price of this stuff, you have to remember the world divides into oil haves and have-nots. The best way of looking at a change in price is to think of it as a big handout from one group to the other. If the oil price goes up, I'm worse off, Saudi Arabia wins, and when prices go down, as they have, it's the other way round. The oil industry and oil exporting countries had gotten very used to $100 oil and uh, just assumed that $100 oil was going to be the normal price forever. Oops, wrong assumption. Here's the price of oil in 2015. It's now half what it was last summer. On a longer view, back 45 years, you can see the recent swing is one of the big shifts of the modern era. Right now, there's simply too much oil. And you can see it if you go to a place like Singapore. I was there very recently. And you can see all the tankers sitting there uh, doing not much, just simply storing oil. When you have $90 oil, people are uh, combing the world for brand new sources of hydrocarbons. You know, there are plenty of uh, different uh, uh, areas which have been developed, and all of them have different uh, financial characteristics, and, and some of them will not survive at these low prices if they continue, as I expect they will continue. You see, new oil came on tap, like US shale. It worked at old prices, but paradoxically, all that new oil drove prices down, killing its own business model. And that's cause of concern number one. Those that lent or invested find they're kind of where subprime lenders were a decade back. We've seen a huge bubble within um, the oil market in terms of, of bonds, and you saw about 18% of, of the, the bond issuance in the US being oil related, um, and we're now seeing significant problems within that market. I think you've seen a lot of the bigger, uh, bigger operators, though they've locked in the oil price for most of next year, so they're, they're still at $60 plus when the current spot price is in the 30s. So they haven't run into problems yet. But clearly the issue is if the price remains, in the 30s and that lock-in expires and, and you end up having to sell at the spot rate rather than $60, that's really where you'll see a more financial distress. From the oil sector then to problems in the financial sector, well, there are other grounds for worry too. You can't separate what's happening with oil prices by themselves from other things that are happening in the world economy. So to some degree, oil prices today are also a thermometer telling us uh, there's a lot of weakness in the world economy. So we will see a, a cycle, but right now uh, the name of the game is uh, survival. Riding along in my automobile My baby beside me at the wheel But forget the losers. Who needs losers? There are winners in the oil market too. Right from the earliest days of our oil-fueled economy, some fundamental rules have applied, telling us that cheap oil is good for growth. It's just vintage economics. Well, as you know, oil-powered automobiles have caught on, and we can do a back-of-the-envelope calculation as to the benefit of an oil price cut. So today, we pumped something like 20 million tonnes, 
20 billion litres of petrol and diesel into our cars. If you cut the price by 15p, that's three billion pounds into the pockets of consumers. Better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. It also supports the economy more generally uh, by creating lower energy costs for businesses and that gives more space for investment and for overall employment uh, in the UK. I think the sort of ready reckoner uh, that we had in our mind is when oil prices fell uh, from over $100 back in the summer um, a, a year and a half ago to uh, closer to $50, that that gave a boost to the UK economy of around 0.5% uh, to GDP. No particular place to go. Oil, of course, ain't what it was in the 50s. Our post-industrial economy is less oil intensive than it was. Old ready reckoners may have weakened. But all in all, while there's a lot to worry about at the moment, cheap oil probably gets two cheers. Two cheers, not three. Just worry about uh, nations who are so dependent on revenues from oil that they may, there may be some unexpected instability. And it usually is unexpected. So it's not all good news, but on balance I would say it's good news for the consumer, not so good news if you're in the oil and gas business. And I should say thank you to the Brooklyn's Museum in Weybridge for the loan of that old Ford motor and the use of the vintage petrol station. Uh, that was a very even-handed uh, account of it. Joining me now is Sir Alan Duncan, Conservative MP, former Minister for International Development uh, and a former oil trader in his own right, and Gillian Tett, uh, US Managing Editor of the Financial Times. Evening to you both. OK, you can see it as glass half full or empty. Is, is the glass half full or empty, do you think, Ginny? Well, you're going to sound like a classic Scrooge if you say it's actually half empty. Um, the reality is it's great for consumers who are driving cars. But if this oil price fall had occurred just because cars were becoming so efficient they didn't need oil so much anymore, or if it was because suddenly people have found a whole bunch more oil, that would be good. The problem is that this oil price fall is partly because of geopolitical tensions and rivalries between Saudi Arabia and the US, but also because demand is falling in places like China, and that is worrying. Right. And you say that the geopolitical thing is that Saudi Arabia is trying to put American oil out of business by keeping the price well, low. Well, this is all to do with rumours and whispers. Right, Saudi yeah. Arabia has never come out and said this, but certainly it does appear that one factor driving policy is the fact that OPEC has been unravelling, but also there was certainly a desire amongst some Saudi leaders to try and undermine the US shale industry. It is extraordinary, though, isn't it, Alan Duncan? Yeah, I mean, we are back to $30 oil, which is where I came in 35 years ago as an oil <laughs> trader. And well, literally 30, 30, yeah, 30, pretty well 30 yeah. yeah, $30 oil. And uh, I think the issue is this. Look, we all love low prices at the pump. But what we have seen over the last year is extraordinary volatility. And that volatility, going down from over 100 to about 30, unleashes massive forces where money moves across the globe and has consequences. And I think the sort of consequences we can see are, of course, the immediate effects of the oil services sector losing jobs yeah. and, of course, the North Sea suffering, and that's going to hurt us as the UK. So that's a downside for us. But we're seeing a lot of oil-producing countries needing something like 80 or $90 oil to pay their way. So if they've got to finance their deficits, they're going to have to suck an enormous amount of money from the Western economies by liquidating their assets or by borrowing. You could then end up with a liquidity squeeze, which could put up our interest rates. And so we will also, as Gillard quite rightly says, be looking at geopolitical pressures in oil-producing right. countries. You These are massive forces. I mean, frankly, if there was ever a moment you don't want these geopolitical pressures, it's probably right now, given yeah. everything else that's happening. Yeah. And it's not just BP. I mean, we had a story yesterday at the FT saying BP slashing jobs, 4,000 jobs, big hit on North Sea oil, Petrobras, big Brazilian operation, they're also cutting jobs. You're seeing a number of emerging market countries, which are big oil producers, having a squeeze right now that, frankly, the world doesn't need in terms of the instability. But, but can, I, can I just ask you, look, it's right to think, essentially, if, you're, if you are involved in oil, it is clearly awful. Mm. Should people who, can now, who are not involved in oil, who don't own BP and who you know, don't work in the oil industry, but who can buy petrol at a pound a gallon, of a pound a litre. Yeah. Should they... <laughs> You're revealing your age. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm, not, I'm definitely saying <laughs> don't think. Exactly. Should they... You called it potentially catastrophic today in the Commons, uh, Alan Duncan. Yeah. You, you, you asked a question to the Prime Minister on it. Well, should... Is it simply 
a problem for people in the oil industry? No, it isn't. I mean, because this volatility leads to instability. First of all, there's global instability politically right. in the Middle East. Let's park that to one side. But if you are a pensioner, uh, you c it's impossible to exaggerate the number of pension funds that rely heavily on Shell's dividends to contribute to their pension pot. So that has an immediate effect within our own economy. So we are looking at pressure in the city and in our banking system. Now, you know, I want, <laughs> I, I, I want people to be able, able to fill up their car for less than a pound a litre. But other things go with that good news. I mean, I wouldn't be quite so gloomy. Um, studies have been done in the US, which of course is much more dependent on much more. petrol, <laughs> gas, whatever you call it, and then the UK, which suggests that late last year they were reckoning an average family was saving $700 a year because of falling oil prices, and that is definitely good. But the really interesting thing is, when you look at whether or not the consumers are actually spending that windfall, it looks like only about half of it's actually being spent, mm -hmm. because people are still pretty scarred by the whole 2008 financial crisis. So if you're looking at the overall economic boost right now, you're probably not going to see what the simple sums back of the envelope calculation suggest. Let me ask you a question, Alan. Suppose we mm. found a big hole somewhere in the North Pole, and out of it just came as much oil as we possibly needed. Mm. Put aside concerns about the planet, because we haven't talked about those, and clearly it's not great for the planet. Out of there came enough oil to give us all free oil in unlimited quantities. Would you tell me that is bad news for the economics of the world, or would you say, thank goodness, that's... We don't have to worry about energy anymore. <laughs> it's a wonderful hypo hypothetical question. But, of course, over the long term, cheap energy would be a good thing. Uh, although some would argue that in terms of green oil... I mean, it's green oil. Let's choose green oil. Evan Davis, green oil. Um, it would dramatically change in historic uh, ways the balance of power, wealth and everything else across the world. It, it would be the end of the Middle East uh, in terms of their wealth, of course. Um, you can write a book about this, I'm sure. I'm sure you feel a novel <laughs> okay. coming on. But it would be, that's the big It would one. be a big deal anyway. Yeah, yeah. Thank what you both very much. Sorry, we have to leave it there. Thanks very much. Well, of course, oil is not the only sector that's been having a hard time. Hotels have been complaining. They face unfair competition.